So uh, right now, I guess we need to move on to saving cyberspace. Your speaker is Jay Healy, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. I know you've got a choice for a lot of talks to come to, and I'm really pleased to see so many of you here. Um, they kind of dorked my bio in the in the uh, in the program. I don't normally uh, cover that, but but since I'm not in fact a Laura Mipsum, um, I better include some. So I first started coming to DefCon 9. Uh, I came out of uh, Air Force Signals Intelligence and left that to go uh, set up the first um, military joint cyber warfighting unit, JTFC and D, in 1998. Then Goldman Sachs set up their first computer emergency response team. And uh, they're at a White House running critical infrastructure protection pro um, programs for the president and cyber programs. Um, and now I get to work at a think tank. So I get to think full time on this, write about what we see going well and going wrong. Um, and it's really a privilege to be in that kind of position. <coughs> so some of our board members are folks like Mike Hayden, um, former NSA and CIA director, Paul Toomey, former, former president, CEO of ICANN. Uh, Jeff Moss is one of the senior fellows in our program. So we have this position to try and sit back and say, what do we think is happening? What are the trends that we think are, are, are going on? And a lot of us have found ourselves in the same space. Um, folks like Dan Gear, who, who, who speaks for, for us and has been a long time friend and advisor, Jane Lute, Mike Hayden, Jeff Moss, we've all found ourselves in this position of saying, maybe the future is not going to look like the past. And that's what the, this talk is going to be about. So when I say why saving, because it's, it's, it's kind of an odd title, I'm going to give different, different takes on that to different audiences. I've got one that I use specifically for DC, another one that I'm talking to the security researcher uh, community, depending on the perspectives. So I'm trying to fit a, a number of those into this talk. And fortunately, therefore, Dave is going to help keep, keep us track on time. So I'm going to switch this around a little bit because I was the single schmuck yesterday, I think I was the only one, when Jeff Moss said, how many people think we're going to keep adding complexity? And I think everybody stuck up their hand and said, and then he asked, how many people think there's going to be an upper limit to the complexity? And I stuck up my hand. Now he, Jeff Moss, when he was saying an upper limit to complexity, he said in regulation, how many people think we're going to have a law that says only this much complexity and only, and only that much. But I worked for the finance sector, um, twice, twice for Goldman Sachs, before and after the White House. And the finance sector thought with their hubris that they could keep adding complexity to this system and that they would know where those risks would lay and that they were smart enough that they could figure out and understand all those risks and they could keep playing the shell game with that complexity. <clears throat> and it didn't just bite them in 2008, it bit all of us in ways that their experts said was impossible. And frankly, I would bet that our field, internet, cyberspace, cybersecurity, is at least as complex as what they had. And at least they had real models. They had roomfuls of PhDs getting million dollar bonuses to try and figure out where their risks were. And we don't really have that, I don't know. If you have a million dollar bonus, then please put up your hand and you're buying drinks for the whole room. Um, so I do think, and that's what this talk is going to be about to some degree, is that what if we have a very different future? A future with these discontinuities where there might be, for example, an upper limit to the complexity. Because in Washington, D.C., where, where um, my think tank is, and, and we tend to deal with um, the DC policymakers um, on a regular basis, we're all worried about cyberspace. Um, and there's a lot of talk about what that is and trying to define it and what's in and what's out. And um, you know, is it a warfighting domain or more likely how it is, it is a warfighting domain or whether it's a global commons. And this is the kind of thing that we talk about. And I've got you know, I'm a, I've got cyber in my title and, and, and we all love that. But what Washington DC has really gotten into is we've, we've chopped off the space at the end of it. We're not talking about cyberspace, um, which at least is kind of a technical term, you know, kind of interconnected IT, I get that. 
but we've cut the space off of cyber and now our nation's capital is largely seeing equating cyber with national security and our cyber policy is increasingly devoid of our internet policy. Internet policy is for the lovers, cyber policy is for the fighters and they don't really come together really anywhere. Maybe the chief of staff at the White House is kind of the one place where that policy comes together. And so we've really militarized this underlying resource of the internet itself. And again, I'm coming from a military signals intelligence background. And this has, I think, pretty significant consequences for our field of cybersecurity, computer security, internet security, data security, however you're coming into this. Because the internet is the coolest thing to come from human brains since Gutenberg invented the printing press. All right, I'll give you, you know, electrical power is pretty cool and there's maybe a couple other things that are in there. But probably for 650 years, this is the most transformative thing that we've come up with. And because we had the printing press and, and because of Gutenberg, it gave us so much. It gave us the renaissance. It enabled that flourishing of art, of science, of thinking, this rediscovering of rationality, this rediscovering of science, um, of freedoms. It led to the Declaration of Independence. It led to so much in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. But imagine if 20 years after Gutenberg invented the printing press, it turns out that the Pope, the petty princes of Europe, pretty much anybody that cared could know exactly what was being printed, exactly who was printing it, and exactly to whom that was being passed. And imagine if the, the bulk of the discussion at that point in human history was about how this violates privacy or violates people's civil liberties and whether it's legal or constitutional, as if those, imagine if those concepts existed at that time. And that's where I'm afraid we are right now in this moment of time for us. If you would have had that, if you couldn't have trusted the underlying communications mechanism, 600 plus years ago, could you have even had the Renaissance or the Enlightenment? If you don't trust the underlying communications mechanism, you don't just change the future of printing, you've changed the future direction of humanity, not just for five years or for 50, but until the ends of humanity on Earth. So let's talk about the internet now. We all know the st statistics, we all know how transformative it is. We no longer really have an economy or a society. It doesn't make that much sense to talk about a digital economy or a digital society. Everything that the economy and society is relying on, for the most part, has been digitized. It's the common medium for everything to happen. And we all know the threats. If you're not here to t hear about a threat talk, we can go and we can hear the mandiants, the crowd strikes, the, the eyesight, there's so many others that know all of the threats. But maybe those threats aren't just bad. Maybe they're actually existential to the internet. Again, if the future doesn't look like the past, if there are discontinuities. Because this is where I feel we are right now. That we're in this trade-off between security and civil liberties and privacy. And of course we're in that place. But to me that's an SCP. And you know what an SCP is? Don, D Douglas Adams fans? All right, you, you get a free book. You get, a, you get one of my history books. Um, what is it? What is it? Exactly. Um, of course that's bad, but to me that has an SEP field around it. It's someone else's problem. I know we've got Jennifer Granick, we've got EFF, we've got ACLU that will cover this. And of course this is important, but I think might be missing the larger questions. In Washington DC when I'm talking to a Beltway crowd of policymakers, I say in our, the way that we've been treating this, the way we've militarized it, the way that we've learned what my former colleagues in Signals Intelligence at Cyber Command um, have, been, have been up to, that we're trading off today's national security problems so that we can spy on China, Russia, terrorists, and we're weighing that more heavily than our future economic and national security 
tomorrow. That we are, have a digital economy, a digital society, a digitized everything, especially the more that we do internet of things, internet of everything, smart grid, and people in glass infrastructure shouldn't be throwing so many stones. But what I really feel, and can say more to this audience, but again, maybe we're balancing today's national security against the future of the internet itself. <coughs> and just like we could imagine that difference between what would have happened if the last such ubiquitous transformative technology of the printing press had been compromised as so entirely as the internet has been, that maybe we are changing the future possibilities to the end. In fact, how many renaissances and enlightenments will humanity miss? Not just us, but our kids and grandkids. If we keep treating this internet, I mean, we're all peeing in the pool. And at some point, we really have to worry about that if we keep treating it as a place for crime, warfare, and espionage. So when I'm saying saving, and I'll, and I'll, I'll put a little bit of context into that, but we want to talk about saving from what? Um, this is a little bit how I led into this. Because we so often talk about incidents. I don't, we hear about incidents a lot. For example, I was talking to a, to a journalist yesterday and she kept asking, well, what if someone does a bank job, someone does a run on the finance sector and they steal all of our money? Well, that would be, in fact, very bad, yes. But I'm more worried about, remember when I was talking about the 2008? What if it's not just an incident? What if it's an actual shock? And Dan Gear touches on this a lot in one, in, in, both in his other talks as well as what he talked about yesterday. Yesterday he brought up what happens if um, a PKI provider goes down. My, one of my fa preferred examples is what if a global cloud provider has a Lehman moment? Remember Lehman Brothers have been around for more than 100 years. What if a cloud provider has all of our data there on, Mon on Friday and it's gone on Monday, like happened with Lehman? all your data you're going to be able to get back just as soon as the courts figure out who owns which data. And they're still trying to unravel Lehman and who, and, and who had which money. In 2014, we can just barely say if we lost one of those global cloud providers, we can probably think about our model, that cascading failure of who else fails when they fail. And I don't really care if they fail because of a cyber attack, if they fail because of a bad business model, they fail because, you know, they mount goxed. Um, thinking about this as shocks that can roll their way through the system and keep knocking people over as they go. That's what happened in 2008 and I think we can think about it here. I love this, this quote from Dan Gere. It's the one on, the, on, on your left. Um, as society becomes more technologic, even the mundane comes to depend on distant digital perfection. I love that as a quote, to really get across that there's so much complexity that we can't understand and perhaps at the end of the day it's going to bite us in ways that we're not anticipating. But when I really think of saving from what, I try and focus on the discontinuities of the places where the future might look incredibly different than it does today. We did this um, military history of cyberspace of, of looking at cyber conflicts, going back to the cuckoo's egg. And my favorite quote from that is this one. Few if any contemporary security controls can stop a dedicated red team from easily accessing any information sought. He actually said tiger team, but I, I changed it out to, to use the more modern term of red team. 1979, uh, Roger Shell, he was, he was one of the fathers of the, of the rainbow series. Um, for, the real, for the real folks in the community, you know, the red book, orange book, blue book series of, of NSA manuals. And he was running what was, what was the Air Force Tiger Team, the Air Force Red Team, in 1979. Which, to me, just, it rocked my world when I really said this. Because it meant, I, I, I call that O is greater than D. The attackers, the offense, have had the advantage since 1979. Because Dan Gear talked about this yesterday, how they had the advantage. Jeff Moss 
last year at Black Hat talked about how the attackers seem to be running away with the field. That's not new. That's been going on for at least 35 years. Which makes me feel sometimes, you know, when I'm in a glass half, half empty mode, that makes me feel like everything that I've done, everything frankly that all of us have done, has been for naught, that we've been wasting our time. Because we haven't changed, we're not winning. <laughs> Everything we've done, the billions that we've spent, all the fantastic ideas that you've come up with, everything you've invented, all of our patents, all the time we've spent at DEF CON and DEF CON parties has at best been to stay even. At best. Dean Gere would call it um, in his more um, um, biology moments a Red Queen effect from Red Queen in um, the uh, Lewis and Carroll. Uh, Alice in Wonderland where the Red Queen has to keep running ever faster just to stay in the same place. Um, so glass half full is we're at best staying even. But it doesn't have to stay that way. So again, I came out of military and, and, and loved military history and we've seen all through human history, uh, you know, since we first picked up stick and stone one another against one another, this back and forth between the offense and the defense. And sometimes the offense will be running away with things like in the Napoleonic era until they get mass, met with mass rifle fire in the Civil War and, and you know, objectified in the machine gun in World War I and then they were dominant until um, others added together disruptive technologies, airplane, radio, tank, with the doctrine to knit them together and use them as one. And in pretty much every kind of warfare, except nuclear and maybe space, you see this back and forth between the offense and defense all the time. And yet when I talk to people in our community, we take, ah, oh, the defense is never going to get better. The offense is always going to have the advantage. But again, it doesn't have to be that way and the future of the internet might look very different. So, hey, we do have some great news. I keep quoting Dan Gear. Um, this, we know security is getting better. We can point to things, we can say, great, you know, in Washington DC we'll talk about the defense industrial base, they're doing better. I talked to folks at, um, uh, you know, I talked to Dmitry Operovich or others and they say, no, 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 in some areas we are definitely getting better. And Dan says, you know, we are definitely notching up personal bests. But unfortunately, the opposition is setting world records. They continue to be better than us 35 years on and so we've been calling this, you know, boy, it's a real wild west out there. But maybe it's not a straight line. Maybe the bad guys aren't just beating us at straight line. Maybe it's actually going at an exponentially rate better than we're doing. And what if it's not just exponentially, but there is some point, a tipping point. Because how many systems can stay in balance when one side has had an advantage for 35 years, year after year, decade after decade, and you're going to hear very few ideas, I suspect, at this black hat that are really going to turn that around for the internet as a whole. How many systems can stay in balance when you keep adding year after year more predators and governments appear to be trying to be compete, more interested in competing to be the best, most efficient, most voracious predator than they are protecting us from becoming prey, how long can that system stay in balance? Where the offense just doesn't just have the advantage, it has supremacy. And we've got a couple examples of that. I say maybe, maybe the future is not going to look like the Wild West, maybe it's going to look like freaking Somalia, right? Had been a wonderful place. Um, beachside resorts and now every time People try to say, no, we want to claim that back. We want stability. We want to get our act back together. There's always some jerks that roll by with AK-47s and a machine gun on the back of a pickup truck that tear them back down. You can also start seeing this in low earth, low earth orbit in space where there's starting to be so much junk in that orbital regime that we can't even really be sure how long those objects, if you launch a satellite, if it's going to be there for two weeks or two years. It's not at a tipping point yet, but it might be close. 
Uh, I was only going to talk about this if I have time, and I think I'm doing. I think I'm doing good on time. Good on time, right, Dave? The uh, anyone know what movie that's from? So, okay, I heard. I heard this one most most clearly. You get a book too. Um, so, what is that in Zoolander? Yeah, that's the gas fight. So who's, who's seen Zoolander? He's a, yeah. Um, oh, wow. All right. Good geeks. It's, and it's all on the left. It's all on the left. The, this side of the room. I wonder where that is. So in this scene in Zoolander, it's all these male models. Um, <laughs> all my colleagues as male models, and um, uh, they they pull into a gas station in a convertible, and they just decide they are really stupid models, and they just decide that it would be a lot of fun to splash each other with gasoline, and they're like, ha ah, and they're spraying one another. And, and you know where this is going to end up, right? These stupid male models are splashing each other with gasoline. And the scene goes on and on, and they're just having all this fun. And then you see it. The one guy takes out a cigarette. Kaboom! And um, it's almost a letdown when it happens, because you know what's happening. It sets up the joke, and you know why this is going to be funny. Because they're stupid, and they're going to get their comeuppance by playing with something they don't understand. And especially when I'm in Washington, D.C., and sometimes when I'm out in Vegas, I get this feeling that this is where we're headed. And it's not funny because we know what happens. When I'm up at Fort Meade, when I hear General Alexander talk, we know we're playing with gasoline. We know we are in the U.S. government. We know the Russians and the Chinese are in the hacker community. We know that we're playing with fire when we've got all this happening with gasoline, when we do all this with this insecure internet, and now we say, great, let's hook it up to the internet of things, and let's connect it to dams and the power grid. And while we're doing that, let's off be seizing all these hills in cyberspace and have Shamoon, I'm sorry, and have um, Stuxnets and have prisms and let's have everything else. And, and unlimited Chinese espionage and, China, and, and Russian sponsored proxy attacks. This is a great idea. But you know what? It's not funny. But we know it's going to happen. We know at some point someone's going to like that match. And the people spraying with gasoline know it too. And this was kind of funny because it was only the models that were spraying themselves. But the people that are putting us into this situation. And I include some of us in this room, even, even ourselves. Um, if, we're, if we're doing security research and we're not fully thinking about how this is going to get implemented, then we're, spraying, we're part of this gas fight. And the models only sprayed themselves, but we're spraying everybody else that's connecting. And when that match gets lit, it's not going to be as funny as it was in the movie. So when I say saving cyberspace, um, a lot of times I would get asked, saving from what? But I really, in the end, mean saving for whom? Because we've kind of fixed this when we're talking about environment. We know in an environment we want a sustainable environment. We don't want just clean air. We want clean air for our kids and their kids and their kids after them. And I'm deeply concerned. Like I think, especially when I'm talking to a DC policy community, if you think your kids are going to have an internet that was open, that was resilient, as awesome, as the one that we had growing up, you really got to question your assumptions in that. I'm not saying it won't be that way, but you really got to question your assumptions. If the, if the attackers keep having advantage year after year, decade after decade, and we don't really have a good strategy to stop that, in fact, a lot of people in DC don't even think it's possible to stop it. They don't even have that as a goal. Because if it's a goal, if it's, if it's not even possible, then we don't have to worry about limiting our own offense, right? So we need to think about how we're going to have this a clean, secure, resilient, awesome internet, not just in 2014, but all the way out for our kids, grandkids, so that we have, they have that chance for, for those enlightenments and renaissance of the things that they can. And um, the Jetpack one came up yesterday. Um, but our parents' generation, and for maybe some of you, your grandparents' generation, where they really thought they were going to have personal jetpacks. They really thought we were going to be doing vacations on the moon or on Mars. That was the obvious and natural direction of the technology. And of course, now we look at it and we say, <laughs> you silly people, 
even though it was technologically possible and feasible, those were dumb directions for the technology. And we kind of laugh at people for thinking that they were going to have personal jetpacks or be able to do vacations on the moon. But when I started to get into this business in the, in the mid-90s, we were sure we were going to be doing electronic voting by now. Right? It was the natural direction of the technology. Of course we will be doing that. And now, like Dan Gere, and I know we've got at least one Estonian in the room, and they're, they've got it going okay, um, but Dan Gere in his keynote yesterday, he didn't even bother to talk about it. He just touched on it and then said, I don't even have to talk about it to this audience. Because we know it's not going to happen for us. How many other of these technologies that we're looking at have to get security right? Smart grid, internet of everything, um, uh, internet, uh, driverless cars, um, cloud robotics, especially cloud-driven robotics. We've got a whole set of technologies that we can only unlock their innovation if we get security right. Why do we think that's going to work? Based on all the threats that you've heard here today. I'm even afraid on some things like online shopping. Again, why are we so certain that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, that's going to be a technological certainty that we're still going to be able to do that? So, talking about solutions, to me the only reasonable solution, goal, for us in our industry is to get defense better than offense. To me, if we're not doing that, then we're never going to turn this around and we're going to be bequeathing to our kids that get involved in this business essentially the same problems that we had at best. <coughs> I would love to get defense way better than offense. That we've got the commanding heights. That it's far more difficult to attack. That they've got all the problems on their side and we've got all of the ease, ease and simplicity on our side. And it's possible. Of course it's possible. It's changed in almost every kind of human conflict like I talked about. So I've got my set of ideas on that. Having a goal of thinking about sustainable cyberspace that gives us this time frame that you don't get when you're just talking about security. We've got to work at scale. We have to, whether individually when we're inventing things, whether there's companies that are rolling out solution, but certainly in capitals, um, like Jeff was talking about yesterday, um, we've got to have solutions that are going to work across scale and we've got, I've got ideas on that. I keep trying to push in Washington DC a private sector centric approach. That is, we've got nine players on the ball field and for too long we've had the government running around saying, I got it, I got it, I got it. When there are tons of companies, of, of nonprofit groups, volunteer groups, um, that are, have positions on the field and can make the play. Maybe they need a better glove, maybe they can't see the ball, maybe they need to run through drills, maybe they need to be reminded that they're actually playing on a team. But we need, and that's not a partnership, this is putting the private sector at the center of our responses because that's how we've solved almost every single cyber problem since there's been an internet. From, um, from Morris Worm and Cuckoo's Egg on forward. It's almost always been the private sector that's there. Um, not saying they don't create tons of problems too, um, but they're the ones that are going to have to fix this. Within Washington DC, I strongly advocate for a, um, right now we've got three different internet strategies, cyber strategies. We've got one that's driven by Commerce Department that says, you know, broadband strategy, um, oversight of ICANN. Uh, we've got another set of strategies from State Department on internet freedom and then we've got military and espionage. And right now it's the military and the espionage that have the most money and the least bureaucratic friction. When you've got three strategies you can't trade off when you have competing priorities. You can't look at it and say, step back and say, you made all of these decisions for valid national security purposes but maybe enough is enough and stepping back and looking at that big picture. And of course disruptive de defensive technologies where we can radically shift things in our favor. And I've heard some ideas like that at here at RSA at other con conferences, you know, things like multi-complier. 
uh, <laughs> compilers where you can take out entire classes of attacks out of the system. And in my closing, I think it's my closing, what are we going to do? What are, what are you going to do as a, what are we going to do as a community and what can you do? Are we sure we're on the right side? So I've been part of this community for a long time and I believe in what it is that we're, that we're doing. But we're not winning. The bad guys still keep edging us out year after year. So I think we have to step back and I don't believe that Jeff Moss or others would disagree on this. To me this is a lot of what the cavalry is about. I am the cavalry and Josh Corman, his fantastic effort to say we can't just keep doing our research, we need to step back and own part of the solution. So that's what I'm saying, are we sure we're on the right side? I am the cavalry is one of the great efforts to say let's make sure that our voice is being heard so that we're doing the right thing here. I really commend Josh and, and the f members of the cavalry and I wonder what else it is that we could do to help make this happen. Great. That's me. Um, and I wanted to leave some time for questions. Hey, 10 minutes. <coughs> or time for early departure. I owe you and you books, so. Sir. I'm not convinced that I, that I necessarily believe government, especially if you say that without an S, implying the United States, is, is the most significant. Um, it's the one that we have the most control over. So it's the one that I try to, try to emphasize and it's the people that I talk to um, every week. So I, I try to emphasize that more. Um, yeah, in, in the front I, I, I took this slide out. But there are a lot of threats. I, you know, you can be saying we'll, we need to worry about Moore's Law, we need to worry about are we smothering innovation, are we worrying about um, balkanization of the internet, um, you know, that we're, we're more likely to have different chopped up national internets than one singular internet. And that is especially one of the places where I think governments are going in the, they're all going in the wrong direction right now. Um, you've got some influence in that. I mean, so in what, what are governments doing? One, they're treating it as a battleground and dark alleys for spying. Two, they've got regulation that, that can smother. Three, specifically balkanization, that is trying and erecting national barriers where they didn't, um, didn't belong before. Um, you've got a couple others in, in there that, that you can consider government trends. Um, and so you've got different things that you can, you can jump, yeah, I mean smothering, smothering privacy or civil liberties. Um, we deal a lot with Europe in our, in our think tank and boy do we get an earful every, every time uh, we talk to them. And so the community can play in those in, in, in different ways. I mean of course the EFF and ACLU do great things there. Um, 
folks like Jeff Moss and Mitra Alberovich, they're both senior fellows with, with, with my program, and they said, you know what, we need to social engineer from the inside. Um, we need to social engineer government so that we can, I can sit at home coding all day for 10 years and I won't have as much impact if I can get on the Hill and talk to Hill staffers. So there are a bunch of those efforts that are starting to kick off. Um, and guys like that that are, that are, you know, have the status to really go in and help pioneer this and get the, get the voices in. Josh Corman organizing I Am The Cavalry. I think those are all good ways that you can start putting, putting pressure in. Is that gonna be enough? I'm not sure, I'm not sure we're there yet. Sir. Ooh. Or, or is there any plot at the Yeah, that's a, it, it's a great question. Um, for those that, I think everybody heard it, but you know, I was mostly focused on executive branch, what about legislature and, and, um, uh, and judicial. I, you know, I hadn't fully thought that through. The, I think some of the, I think the, Right now, a lot of what Congress is doing is small ball. Um, you know, think, you know, fetishizing um, information sharing. Um, of saying, you know, as if we are going to information share our way to defense better than offense. And of course it's going to be helpful. But I keep looking for these solutions that are going to change to make defense better than offense for a company, for a sector, for a nation, and really for the internet as a whole. And I don't see anything coming out of Congress that's gonna do any of those four. So I would love to try and see um, more legislative oversight on the military and espionage. It's very easy, I mean, they've got the large staffs, hyper-competent folks up at Fort Meade, lawyers that always wanna to get to yes, relatively easy compliance in Congress. Um, so I think a bit more legislative emphasis for the internet that matters on the rest of us and some checks on that system would be very useful um, if we had one set of internet policies within the White House and, and outside. Uh, as far as judicial, I think it's going to be tough because that's going to have to be following the laws. I mean, unless we can really make, um, there's probably legal cases to be made on what's constitutional or not and maybe not even extending out of privacy, if we can show harm, like for example, Microsoft had to respond and patch their systems after uh, Flame. Um, so appears US government used um, not just four zero days for Stuxnet, but also might have um, put themselves into the change of, of Microsoft update and even falsified um, security certificates. So Microsoft Security Research Centers, others had to drop everything that they were doing and responding to that. If the government is using zero days, there's a possible case you could show for harm and saying how this, this, this is hurting us. Uh, I don't know if, we, if any company would ever want to try to make that case, but it would be an interesting case to be made. Uh, I'd also be curious if there would be a law sh uh, more shareholder lawsuits, um, especially in cases like um, where the government has ordered the company not to talk about it. RSA, Lockheed Martin. I mean, I think you might be able to see interesting shareholder lawsuits out of that. Thank you. Sir? There's a that you didn't mention. I don't think we're going to cop our, so the, the question was about what about di diplomats and what about state local law enforcement especially. Um, I thank God for the cops, the judges, the prosecutors um, that have, have been making some difference, but we're not going to cop our way out of this, this problem, right? I mean, 
Um, frankly, more than state and local governments would be the MLAT process, the legal assistance process. Um, and so, to me, the law enforcement is like education, cyber education, trying, trying to train the stupid new users not to, not to click on everything. It's going to be important, but it's never going to get us, I don't think, to getting defense better than offense. Diplomacy is far more important. We've got maybe 30 diplomats right now that are handling every aspect of this other question, that are handling internet freedom, which is the primary goal. That's an important goal. But that's, that's taken center stage over, for example, ICANN and internet resiliency. Um, and those 30 folks are doing everything from bilaterals with China and Russia, bilaterals with India, bilaterals with Estonia, um, working with ASEAN, you know, these regional groupings, um, talking about internet governance, talking about in internet freedom, talking about... Um, so I would love to see a plus up uh, in places like that. You know, DUD is going to be bringing on something like 6,400 new cyber guys. We've got 30 diplomats. Um, and absolutely DOD, let's get cyber guys. But those 6,000 plus equal way more than exist, I would bet, in DHS, State Department, Commerce Department combined. So I'd love to see, for example, a regional cyber diplomat. Um, when I lived in Hong Kong, there was a regional intellectual property di diplomat that was out of Bangkok. Um, um, in, yeah, intellectual property. So his job was to regionally coordinate to make sure that we were protecting, protecting intellectual property. Well, okay, great, I get it. You know, protecting software, protecting Mickey, that's important stuff. But what are our real priorities here, right? So I would love to see the State Department pl plussed up on this. They've got great teams led by Chris Painter, um, the guy that locked up, uh, that prosecuted Kevin Mitnick, oddly enough, um, is, now, is now our top diplomat. Um, let's make that ambassadorial rank because that can really help on a lot of the problems that we talked about. Um, I saw one and then two. Jason, you write about the history and, and the future. I did. It's yes. in the bookstore, by the way. So, Are, Is this an evolutionary process that we're experiencing where, like the plague, it's going to get to a tipping point oh. and we're going to, the resilient will survive, but you're really countering a very natural force that you're not going to change. Yeah. And we, we can predict it or we can examine it, we can be a part of it. Yeah but you're really yeah. uh, spinning your wheels. Yeah, uh, and, and I've been asked right before this, you know, for what's the teaser, you know, can we save it? Um, it depends where that line is for tipping point. Again, I think a tipping point is possible, and if we run the clock out far enough if tipping point is possible, then it, there's a good chance it's going to be probable or inevitable. Um, and so I hope not. But it just depends where that is. You know, it depends how much time we've got left on the clock. You know, the Federation of American Scientists had a, you know, the two minutes to midnight nuclear clock. You know, how, how close are we? Um, and we haven't sat down yet to say, all right, how would we know if we were getting close to tipping point? Um, and I think that's probably going to be some of, the, some of the things we're looking at over the next year. I mean, is it likely in five years, 50 years? I mean, you know, how much by smart technology deployed intelligently um, can we can we keep pushing pushing that farther back? Um, but I think the most important thing is to start recognizing it's not all about the incident. That the future isn't going to look like the past just with more dangerous adversaries and cooler technology. Um, that you might have these discontinuities. And I think that's where we are in the risk management conversation right now is just trying to trying to triangulate ourselves in that space. Thanks a lot. Yes. Right, great question. Or if it should really be going in a different kind of direction with the compart yeah. like specialization of That's a great question. Today? Yep. So, um, so I teach a couple classes in Washington D.C. In, in Georgetown and, and, and Johns Hopkins Sice to try and teach the policy folks enough about cyber and what's different and what's the same to what they've been taught. Um, and try and give them some space to understand what you guys do and how this gets handled in the Washington DC bureaucracy. Um, and we need to really flip that also to make sure that 
y'all know and the people that are coming up through the computer security um, educational field, which is now a field, right? It didn't even, you know, when we started coming out here, it wasn't a field, you know, it was just kind of latched on to, some, to something else. You know, we, we, most of us probably came to this by studying something else and coming into this. Um, and giving some of that Washington, D.C. policy making and get out that word. It's one reason we wrote this book, to try and write this, not just for the wonks to understand what the geeks do, but for the geeks to understand this is how Washington, D.C. is these issues. Um, you know, because if you get guys like Dmitry Alperovich, Jeff Moss, others that say, to be effective, we have to, Josh Corman, we have to start playing in policy. We need to start getting some of that policy out. Uh, we run a, a cyber competition, different like pretty much any others. Most cyber competitions are capture the flag, hack, counter hack. Ours is all on the policy side. As if, so we bring in students as if they're advising the president and the National Security Council. Mr. President, nobody has died yet. Um, this is too early, we can't call NATO, but um, we can start um, thinking about targeted sanctions. You know, let's start getting the diplomats, getting our allies involved, and that inside the beltway. Um, I also just pitched my last year's talk, which was um, above my pay grade incident response at the national level, um, which you can pull up off, uh, online to say what happens at incident response outside of the four walls of the company. How does it go from, for example, banks up to the financial services ISAC, up through Treasury and the Secretary of the Treasury and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve? How does it make its way up the Department of Homeland Security through the White House? How do all those different, you know, what happens inside Washington, D.C.? So if you're curious about that, I'd also take a look at that talk from last year. Thank you. And I don't see any questions, which is good, because I, oh, oh my, I've got two, two more. Do I have time? Let me take both questions and I'll answer. Let me take the gentleman in the back, Greg number three, and then, and then we'll come forward. See, ah, I remembered. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, interesting. Okay, good. And then let me take this one. Okay, if you can make it quick, I've only got two minutes. I'm sure you can talk about tipping points. Uh, do you think there was a little tipping point when, I mean, recently the U.S. announced that they were treating some of the Chinese hackers as uh, government hackers and criminals? Meh. But even more strikingly, Canada seemed to be fed up enough to publicly, um, you know, call out yeah. 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 No, I don't see any. I don't see any tipping points in that. The. Um, I mean, we've had some nice points that might have been tipping point. You know what? What crowdstrike has been doing. What Mandian had been doing. Um, Angela Merkel in 2007 told Beijing, "Stay out of my laptop." The United States might have chosen that moment to take our stand rather than six years later. So no, 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 no tipping points in there. Uh, and and I don't think there will be until the U.S decides, I mean, we've said this is the distinction that matters. Commercial espionage is the thing that matters, and you can spy as much online as you want as long as you don't give that to a company that then commercializes it. That is the, the main distinction that matters in Washington, D.C. The way other people see this um, uh, don't fit in too much. So, no, no, no tipping points there. Um, the, this whole book was about the wake-up calls. And we've had eight different wake-up calls so far, minimum, at least when we wrote this in, in 2012. Um, so if you, if you ha keep having wake-up calls, then it's a snooze bar, right? So th there's been nothing recently from Heartbleed on, from Heartbleed Target, um, that I see is um, anything other than a snooze bar. Um, good, good question on, on Beijing and Moscow. Um, and that's gonna be, it, it's gonna be difficult. Um, a lot of Washington D.C. says, why should we pull back on our spying and attack because the other folks aren't going to do that as well. We're, universe, we're, we're unilaterally disarming. But again, we've got the most to lose in the United States. Um, and the government says, why should we pull back? We would be the ones to lose. But no, it's all of us that are losing, right? I mean, by saying, no, we want absolute every right to spy and attack like the other guys, then we are continuing to put our economy and all of us and all the companies that we defend at risk. So I think we can afford to have a slightly different calculus. And I think it, it really burnt American credibility on this um, 
to get so far out on the limb and complain about Chinese behavior when we were doing stuff that, again, relied on this single distinction of, of you can spy all you want, just don't give it to a company. We pushed the President of the United States all the way out on that limb to tell the Chinese president that the m most important central part of our relationship was getting past spying. Not civil rights, not our joined economies. The central point that we had to discuss was Chinese behavior for spying. And our national security community pushed him out on that based on this one distinction of you can spy as much as you want, don't give it to a company. So that I think is a huge foreign policy gap that's going to burn all of our companies for a long time to come. I want the U.S. national security priority to be prosperity first and foremost. And we push that and that is now our policy. That's what our diplomats push. That's what um, our communications be with Beijing and Moscow. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. <laughs>